praise. Hey, Graham. Uh, Nolan, praise. How are you? Hey, Sean. <laughs> hey, Ricardo. I mean, hello, please. <laughs> um, the devil done got in my internet connect. What is happening here, Jesus? Well, guess we'll have to go with what we have in the Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs> Not deep worship face. That's hilarious. All right. Lucia. That's what I'm saying. Hey, Dayrum. How are you? I mean, how have you been? It's been forever. Hey, Eric. Um, you all know I usually start with a song. Like, what's happening here? Um, praise, Kendra. This is my song of praise for the week. <laughs> I Believe by Maria Jenkins. Hallelujah. Hey, Timothy. I believe. I believe. Well, internet's not working tonight, but we're going to do what we can and can what we do. Hallelujah to him. Um, but it's okay because I don't really need um, internet for what we're going to talk about tonight. Um... Listen, this Maria Jenkins, this is the only song I've been playing. Let me tell you something. I believe that's it. Even when it all right, even when it says that I should not believe, I still believe. Hallelujah. Even when people say that I shouldn't believe, I still believe. Maybe we'll talk about that. Hallelujah. But yeah, this is my song of praise for the week. Listen, the woman of God said the devil can't make me take it back. Okay? I believe in Satan. There's nothing you can do about it. Why? Because I believe. And I believe because Emmanuel lives. That was amazing. She wrote this. Give me a half a second, y'all. I wonder why my internet's not working. That's what I want to know. That's, hey, Aunt Mel. That's what I want to know. <clears throat> I want to know why my internet's not working tonight. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, we starting it on half. We starting it. We starting it up half tonight. Hallelujah. Come on, plug your church, Kendra. Listen, you got to let these people know. You got to remind yourself. You got to remind the enemy that you still believe. Even when things and people in the situation. I'm sorry, we got one more minute, then we're going to start. Even when things say that you should not believe. You still got to believe. Let me make sure my phone's going to do not disturb. Hey. Uh, <laughs> I was going to call you your nickname. Hey, Cordero, how are you? Hallelujah. She said, because Emmanuel lives, I believe. Let me tell y'all something. This song is amazing. I don't know what the rest of the CD sound like, but this song right here. Hey, uh, William. This song right here, though, it did it for me. It did it for me. <laughs> it did it for me hallelujah to him alright I think we've got one more minute is it 7 on 5 yet my phone is currently blocking the time on my end and I really want to know what's going on with my internet connection because Satan and got up in it somehow hey Wyetta hallelujah Let me tell you something. This, she should, listen, she should have done a reprise to this. Uh, 705. All right, cool. So let's pray and let's get into, Jesus. Satan don't want me to be great, but I'm going to do this anyhow. 
Um, we're going to get into this and then we are going to be done. Listen, this, this holler. Okay, we'll let the rest of this song play out. It's almost over. And then we'll go ahead and start. So maybe we'll end it. Because Emmanuel lives, I believe. What do I believe? I believe that any and everything he said concerning me, he's big enough and he's bad enough and he's God enough to bring it to pass. Listen, I believe it. And even when I don't believe, I got to tell myself that I believe it. I got to rehearse my belief so that it gets down in my spirit so that the only thing that I speak is faith. Never fear, never doubt, never defeat. I believe because Emmanuel lives. There's a, uh, another lady that I know, uh, or not know, but heard of or know of. Her name is uh, Pastor Darlene Bishop. And she created an acronym for BELIEVE. And it says, because Emmanuel lives, I expect victory every time. You got to learn how to believe. All right, so at 7.05, probably, yep, yeah, but 7.07, we're two minutes late. Okay, let me stop clapping, because I think every time I clap, that's when the phone shifts. All right, so, Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, we honor you, we give you praise, we give you glory, because you're good and because you're God. We thank you for this time and this night of fellowship and interaction. Father, we're praying, oh God, that somebody would be encouraged by the testimony and the testimonies that will be shared on tonight and even going forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, there's power in the clap. Just going to learn how to sit this thing up right, huh? All right, so um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. This is Tuesday Talks uh, Testimony Edition. So, and this is something that I've told many times before. Um, and I'll share with you all just a little tidbit if I feel the release <laughs> to do so of what's uh, presently going on and why I've been asking people to pray and to, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, so, um, 10 years ago, this weekend, this past weekend, and I wanted to do this yesterday, but the bed wouldn't loose me, so I could not. Um, Ten years ago, uh, Memorial Day weekend, I was diagnosed with a really, 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 really rare condition, neuro neurological condition called Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, it's a disease where your immune system attacks your nervous system, and it causes them to fight one another. So if you've ever, like, sat on your foot and it fell asleep, or if you've, like, laid on your arm and you woke up and it's kind of like that numb... Come on, muscle. Sorry, that numb, tingling feeling. It was uh, that was what I felt from the neck down. So we'll start a little further. Family, uh, my family went on vacation to Williamsburg. I think earlier that week, and so we got back. And at that time, I was working retail, and so I was at work, and my feet started to swell. And I was like, "Well, okay, maybe it's me shifting the table." <laughs> Um, my feet started to swell, but I was like, you know, it's just probably because I'm working retail or something, you know, just being on my feet all day, you know, my feet are just, you know, kind of swollen or whatever, but it was really, really painful, really uncomfortable. Hey, Quentin, and so I decided to leave work early that day. Now, mind you, I just come back from like a week off or something, and so my boss was like, you know, you can go home, but she actually, she had an attitude. So I went home that Thursday, um, and I came back to work that Friday the following day. And um, I had on like bedroom slippers. I was working retail, standing behind the counter. And everybody knows that I didn't, at that point, I used to like dressing up. So I would never wear like bedroom shoes. And so everybody's like, well, what's wrong? And I'm like, my feet are really numb. They're tingling. I don't know what's happening. I'm just unsure. But, you know, I'm here. And so I did the rest of my shift. And I think that day, that evening, that Friday, because my aunt um, who's here, she was in the military. She was getting ready to be sent off to Iraq or sent off overseas. And so her church wanted to do a going away service for her. And at that time, I used to dance in church. So they wanted me to dance. And so I said, okay, we'll dance. And the song that I danced to that night was Encourage Yourself by Donald Lawrence. Um, I did not know while I was dancing that that was the song that I was going to have to need, or that I was going to need to get me through what I was getting ready to go through. Um, so we get to the church and we dance. And the minute that the music starts, the tingling in my hands, or oh, I'm sorry, in my feet stops. It's it's gone. So we're dancing. Hey, Monique. Hey, Clarence. We're dancing, and everything is great, and everything's wonderful. The minute that the dance is over and the music stops, the tingling starts back in my feet, and then it starts in my hands. Hey, Clarence. Hey, uh, Shashan. So I'm telling my family, you know, like, hey, this is what's going on. I don't really know how to handle this. Like, it's really, really painful. So they're like, okay, we'll go to the hospital tomorrow. So I'm starting to walk a little slow. It's really starting to affect me. And so we get to the hospital on Saturday. We're there all day, just about. And they tell me, you know, all the tests that we run, they've come back negative. Like, we don't know what's going on. So I follow up with a neurologist on Tuesday because that was Memorial Day weekend. Everything was going to be closed on Monday. 
They give me a referral. Hey, Latoya, and we go to Olive Garden, the grossest place in the world, right? So we get there, and I order my food, and by this time, whatever's going on starts to affect my taste buds, and so I don't eat any of my food. Everything tastes horrible. The only thing I ate was the breadsticks because they really didn't have a taste. And so we went home that evening, and by the time we left, like, I was limping, and I needed somebody to help me get to the car and all this other stuff. So we get home that night, so it's Saturday going into Sunday, and I wake up in the middle of the night, and it started to affect my legs. So now my legs and my knees and my thighs are starting to tingle. And so my grandmother says, Justin, iron my clothes. Hey, Lamia. She says, iron my clothes for church today. And so I get up, and I literally have to crawl from the couch to the table because I could not walk. It was really, really difficult. And this was Sunday morning. And so at that point, I loved going to church. I still do, but love going to church. And so uh, I didn't go to church that day. And so my family said, oh, gosh, we know something's going on because he's not going to church. So they, you know, sit in the tub for a little while because I think at that point I was running a fever. I just started feeling really, really hot all the time. So let me take a cold bath and do this, and then we'll check on you when we, you know, get out of church. And so everything was, you know, that. Hey, Troy. So after they left church, they uh, came home, and I was just doing bad. Super weak, super, super hot, just really wanted to just, like, lay in front of the fan and just do nothing. So they took me to the hospital. I was able to, hey, Gabe, when I left the hospital, or when, I'm sorry, when I left the house, I was able to walk to the car a little slow. But I was able to walk. By the time we got up to the hospital, I could not walk. They needed to put me in a wheelchair. So they wheeled me into the hospital and they do all of this stuff. They admit me, you know, this is what's going on. So everybody has their own little theory about this and about that. And I'm just completely oblivious, like, what's happening? Like, this is really, really just super bad. So we get to the hospital and we start to, you know, the doctors start to run their tests and they're doing the same thing. And, you know, were you in the hospital yesterday? Yeah, I was in the hospital yesterday. Um, they told me to follow up with a neurologist, but it's gotten, you know, noticeably worse. Like, what's going on? We need to come and get checked out. And so I think it was that night. Um, I'm not sure if it was that, that night or maybe later on or something like that. But they said, we want to do a spinal tap. And I said, okay, well, what's that? And they said, we got to stick this needle in your back and all this other stuff, and, you know, drain some fluid. And I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah, no, like, we don't know. Why do we have to do that? And they said, because we want to test and make sure that it's not meningitis and that it's not something else and so I'm like oh god so by this time um, everything is starting to feel numb like I'm losing feeling in my hands and in my legs hey Kevin and in my feet and all of that and um, they do the spinal tap so the first time they do it they hit something and it was just really really painful so they pull the needle out and I just throw up everywhere on the floor we're just bleh, all over the place and so they go forth and they do it again. And I'm like, oh, gosh, like this is painful. And then the only thing in my head is, like, God, I don't want to move because I don't want to be paralyzed for the rest of my life. Um, so they do the spinal tap and they pull the fluid and they do all of that stuff. And, you know, they just, I don't know. You know, they come back and they're like, it's not meningitis. We don't know what's going on. So they call in a specialist. And the specialist does a couple of tests. He's like, you know, push my hands. So I try to push and he's pull my hands and I try to, you know, resist, but it's just not working and I'm, I'm literally feeling the strength leave my body to a degree. And he says, I know what this is. This is Guillain-Barre syndrome. And I'm like, what is that? And so my family's like, Guillain-Barre? Like, what is that? Is this something you made up? So we start to do research and we begin to, you know, look at this and look at that and all this other stuff. And so then they admit me. This is bad. You know, it's not, you know, we don't know how this is going to go, but they admit me. So I'm in the hospital. And I'm there for probably about a week or so, maybe a little less than that. And um, every day they come and, you know, how's your breathing? Are you breathing on your own? Are you swallowing? And all this other stuff. So because everything's starting to taste nasty, hey, Maria, um, I don't want to eat. So I don't really have an appetite. Um, and it's just really, really bad. So one day I'm eating some Jello because everybody knows I've always loved to eat sweets and junk and just snacks and stuff. Um, so my family gives me some Jello, And while I'm eating the Jello, I start choking. But I'm thinking that it's going to, you know, like I'll cough it up and it'll be fine. But what happened is that my lungs or whatever, they started to, to weaken and I was on my way out of here, death by jello. So they, you know, called the doctors and they rushed me out and all this other stuff. And so then they put me on life support because they're like, hey, September, um, listen, this is this is bad. We put me on life support. So that was the beginning of my four day life support journey. So while I'm there, I'm kind of in and kind of now I'm a little sedated. And so I'm, I'm hearing some of the things that are going on, and they rushed me from that hospital to another one. Uh, to they, I was in Holy Cross. They rushed me from Holy Cross to University of Maryland in Baltimore, which is where I spent my entire summer in 2007. 
So we get there and they start to run these tests and I'm like, well, what's going on? So I wake up and the tube is in my throat, but I don't know what's going on at this point. So the tube is in my throat and I'm trying to adjust it and trying to fix it. And so they come and they restrain me. So when I finally wake up and I come to, my hands are tied and I don't know what's going on. And I have this tube down my throat. And so people are trying to tell me what's going on and I'm just kind of panicking or whatever. So uh, we fast forward a little bit to that. And the, the tube comes out and I'm kind of hearing and kind of finding out what's going on. I remember, you know, some things happening with my uncle and some church people and stuff like that. They came to visit me. Um, one of the things that my family said that the uh, hospital staff was saying, we they came up to visit me because there were so many people coming and they were like, we want to know, hey, Liasia, who this Justin Ruffin person is because all our visitor stickers have gone to him. And if he's making this much of an impact on these people, we want to know what's going on and who he is. So they come up and they, you know, hear the story or whatever. And so we leave. And so we're there and we're trying to recover until they start giving us this, uh, giving me this treatment. I'm trying to figure out what's going on and try to figure out ways to stop it. And so uh, the life support happens. And every time somebody would come in the room to give me some medication or something, I would ask them uh, a couple of questions. Who are you? What are you here for? And do you sing? The random, most random question um, in the world, do you sing? And so some people would say yes and some people would say no. And, you know, the Lord started that, that, that sickness 10 years ago. Um, and it may have even started a little before then. But uh, when I first, I guess, started to notice it in a, a greater way is when the Lord first kind of like pushed me. Um, into the prophetic like I was talking to people and this one lady I'll never forget I can't remember her name but I asked I said do you sing and she said yes and I said well can you sing for me <laughs> and she was like no because when I sing I get really really vulnerable and I just feel this and all this other stuff now mind you I'd never really you know I didn't know a whole bunch back then but I told her I said that's the craziest thing I've ever heard I said because when you sing it's from that place of vulnerability that God begins to use you to minister to the people I didn't even know what I was saying so I know that that was God putting his words in my mouth to tell me and she kind of like wanted to cry and broke down a little bit. And so she was like, you know, I'll never forget that and all this other stuff. Great, whatever, wonderful. Um, so we're there and, you know, things are happening. And, you know, the doctors at this point are starting to come in with all these negative reports. You know, but we don't know if he'll recover. And if he does, it'll take weeks to months to years before he does. And, you know, all of this stuff. And I'm sitting there and I'm listening to what they're saying. And in the middle of one of the treatments, I just went off and started speaking in tongues. Like God literally, like he kind of dumped himself on me. And I was talking and I was worshiping and my family was just kind of like, well, what's going on? And while I was there, the Lord began to minister to me and he started to tell me, one, why I was there. And number two, what he was going to do and how he was going to bring me out and what I needed to do when I got up and got out. And so he said, I put you here to save you from yourself. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So back at that point, 10 years ago, hey, Jermaine. I was uh, I was in a place where I just really <laughs> listened. At that point, I wasn't even talking about a report. I just didn't know what was going on. So, um, Kendra, why are we wowing? <laughs> um, oh, I'm sorry. Maybe that was for you. Hallelujah to him. Um, and so we're there, and the Lord said, I put you here to save you from yourself. And I said, well, what do you mean? So at that point, I was just living my life. My grandmother was trying to tell me. The wages of sin is death. I was like, girl, bye. I'm not paying nothing. God got, you know, his hand is on my life. I can do what I want to do. Um, and then when I get ready to come back to him, when I get ready, I'm good. When I get ready to surrender fully, you know, I'll do that. And he's on my time. God had to show me, I'm not on your time. You're on mine. And if you don't get it together, you're going to be out of time. Huh? <laughs> so, we're there. You back? My cousin's hating because she don't have a testimony. <laughs> so we're there and, and the Lord says, I, I did this because I wanted to save you from yourself. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? So like I said, I was living really, really, really crazy. I wasn't smoking and drinking or nothing like that, but I was, I was sexing a lot, you know, sexing a lot, entertaining a lot. I mean, I was starting it up. I mean, busting it down. Oh my God. And <laughs> hallelujah, we thank him for deliverance. Um, and so at that time I was talking to somebody and we were dating and we had made plans to meet up like the follow the week. Yeah, we had made plans to meet up because my days off from school were Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we had made plans to meet up that Tuesday and we were going to bust it down. You know, we had made plans to bust it down. Um, what I did not know was that that person had something that I did not want. Um, and they didn't find out until after everything had already kind of, you know, come out. And so, you know, we're there, we're in the hospital, and God's like, I did this to save you from yourself, but uh, I'm going to heal you, but when I heal you, I need you to do what it is that I've been calling you and asking you to do. And I'm like, well, what's that? I'm not trying to do that. Talking about this whole preaching prophecy, and I'm like, listen, give me something else. I do not want to do that. 
And so we go on with the process and there are things that happen throughout the process. So I lost the ability to walk and the ability to, you know, do certain things like feed myself. There were certain words or um, what they call, I think, bilabial sounds. So any word that uh, caused my lips to touch, I had to learn how to say all over again. So, for instance, saying the word bad, I would put a V there and say, uh, she's so bad. Because, I listen, I'm going to pass the mic in a minute. <laughs> Grams remembers because she would she would never sleep. I was talking some stuff that I had no business talking and making some plans that I had no business making. And when I did not have enough sense to pull myself back and to put my back, uh, to put myself, listen, I mean by, to put myself back in right standing and back in right alignment with the Lord. He decided that over 2,000 years ago when... He died. He said, I, one of the things, he said, I'll create this disease that one in a million people get that Justin will not fit the statistics for. He won't fit any of the criteria, but I'll afflict him with that to save him from walking into a trap that he doesn't even know is a trap for him. And so we get there and we do all of that stuff. And so the doctors do what they do and they're doing all this stuff. And every day they would come in and they would say, you know, he might not recover. He might not make it if he does and if he does and in the event that this and you know, all of this other stuff. And by that time, after the Lord started to talk to me about where I was and why I was there and all this other stuff, I would always tell them, you don't know who I am. Listen, so when the Bible says it was good that I was afflicted because it was in my affliction that I learned your law, I live that and I understand that uh, there is an education that comes with affliction. There's a level of maturity and a level of wisdom that comes through affliction if you go through it the right way. So, they would come and I said, uh, so then they would always say, so one day this lady came in, she was a nurse or something, and she, I, you know, I asked her the same question, you know, I know who you are, but who are you, like, what are you here for? And what are you giving, when they were giving me medication, what medications are you giving me? So she was running off the names. I said, wait, 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 wait. That last one doesn't sound familiar. She said, it's new. I said, well, what is it for? And she said, it's an antidepressant. I said, well, who said I was depressed? She said, well, I recommended this to the doctor. And he thought that it might be good because a person of your age, because at that point I was 20, I was 17. She said, a person that's your age, um, you know, all of this stuff that's going on, you know, they were able-bodied and they were healthy. A person that's your age might be depressed. I said, I get it, but I'm not depressed and I'm not taking that. Of course, she tried to hurry up, you know, tried to do it. And I said, listen here, ma'am, we're not taking an antidepressant. By that time, moms was there and the she bear and her came out. And long story short, we didn't take the medication. Um, so we're there and we're doing all of this stuff. And, you know, we're losing weight and just all types of things are happening and going through my mind. And, I, you know, even though the Lord told me that he would heal, it's something about when the doctors come in with another negative report. When they come in to do these treatments, when you have to sit through these things over and over again. You start to get a little weary and be like, God, listen, are you you sure you're going to heal me? Like, and if, if so, how? You know, because these doctors know a lot more about this thing than I do. I've never heard of this thing. They've seen these cases before. So how is it that you're going to do this? Because what you said doesn't line up with what I see. But I know that you're not a liar. I know that you are not unjust. I know that you are not the type of God that would dangle healing in front of my face and then snatch it back when I feel like I'm about to obtain it. But how are you going to work this out for me? And so we're there and we're doing all of these things and we're taking these tests and we're getting these medications and we're telling, you know, mom's telling people off and they're advocating and they're fighting for me. And at this point, the only thing that I could do was lay there um, because I wasn't able to, I, I couldn't turn over by myself. I couldn't scratch my nose. I couldn't go to the bathroom on my own. I couldn't do anything. So I literally had to have somebody there to help me 24-7. My grandmother you all, a lot of people don't understand our relationship because in the beginning of that whole thing, she was there 24-7. I had the AC on 50, like as cold as it could go. I had that there. I had a fan blowing on me 24-7. Um, I would have sometimes people pour ice water down my back because I was so hot internally. Every day they would come in, my grandmother, she would grab my toes. Can you feel your toes? Can you feel your legs? And all this other stuff. And so one day they were doing, I think this was doing like the beginning part of the process. She told me, the doctor said, close your eyes. I'm going to poke you in your hand with a needle. And you let me know when you feel it. And so we're laying there. And my eyes are closed. And she's poking. And, but I say, you can start now. And she said, Mr. Ruff, and I've actually already started. And I looked down and I saw her poking me in my hand with a needle that I could not feel. And so at one point, I guess she poked a little too hard and I started to bleed a little bit. 
And my grandmother said, Justin, you're bleeding. And I said, I don't feel anything. And I started to cry. I cried a lot then, which is probably why I don't cry so much now, because I think all the tears that I could have cried in my life happened to come out of my eyes 10 years ago. <laughs> So we do that and we get through all of that stuff. And so we're in the hospital 42 days. And so after God, you know, starts to move in the process and everything is kind of on the up and up, they move me over into the inpatient rehab. And I really wanted to leave and just come home and, you know, just get back to living my life or, or my new life. Because at that point, God told me that he was, you know, meant to save my life. But I still didn't know um, what, all of the stuff that I knew when I got out. So we'll get there in a minute. So we're there and we start talking. To the Lord and we start, you know, we start talking to people and, you know, I'm starting to laugh a little bit more and starting to eat just a little, little bit. But then they put me on a mechanical food diet or puree diet or something like that, which was the grossest and the worst thing that anybody could have ever done to me. If you ever want to torture me, give me pureed food. I promise you. It's it's if you've never had it, thank God that you've not had it. Um, so we've got, you know, we did that and we were like, no, 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 I can eat now. Like, give me some real food. But even that food wasn't the greatest. Um so we're there and we, you know, they move us out of the ICU and people could only come and they had to have on a mask and then they put me in my own room and then we were there and doing that and all of that. So then we had to go through the therapy. And so uh, during occupational therapy, I had to learn how to stretch and how to sit up and how to shower for myself and, you know, all types of things that people take for granted. The ability to roll over by yourself in the bed is something that I could not do. The ability to get up. You know what? I want to get up. I want to go to the refrigerator. I could not do. When you want to tell somebody off, you want to say something, when you want to communicate a message to a person, I could not do that without them saying, what did you say? I don't understand. Um, one thing that I always took pride in was my handwriting. But when I first started to learn how to write again, I had um, I had utensils that uh, where the handles were probably about this thick. So I would have to hold them to eat and to write and to do all of these things. And I literally had to go back through like a kindergarten process, like learning how to write, learning how to type all over again. Um, and it wasn't, you know, people were praying and I was just like, God, listen, I don't necessarily see these prayers happening or taking place right now. Um, so we get there, you know, we're in the, re uh, the inpatient rehab and we're taking the therapy and the people are doing what they're doing. And I had a nasty attitude because at that point I had been laid up in the bed so long, it hurt to sit up. So they had to allow me to sit up and, you know, strengthen me in those ways and do the stretching and do the pulling and do the reaching. And it was difficult, but I had to go through all of that to get here, to get to this point, to get to this moment, to, to really be able to definitively declare that God is a healer. And I did not understand the fullness of what he was doing then. And so, um, you know, of course, after something so great and so traumatic, you come home and everything is Jesus, 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 right? So this was during the days of Yahoo Instant Messenger. And so, um, right, why had like every, all of my family members, every church, every, everything, um, anybody who was saved, they were asking people to pray because we needed God to work a miracle. Um, and it was really, really difficult. So, you know, we do that and we're getting there and we're, you know, coming out. And so when I got home, um, I was like, you know, God can do anything but fail. And so the person that I was getting ready to bust it down with before I went through this whole process um, asked me, they said, Justin, if God can do anything but fail, or if God can do anything, why can't he fail? I said, you know, gave this deep answer because there's no failure in him. Da, 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 da. And so they said, well, I feel like God failed me. I said, well, what do you mean? And so then they started telling me about the diagnosis and I was sitting there and I, I was crying, um, number one, because I, I, I was just so shocked about all that was going on, but I started to think about how strategic God was with saving me from something, like I said, that I did not know that I needed to be saved from. Um, at that time, again, like I was smelling myself and I just knew that I could do it on my own and I just wanted to be this big, bad, bold, independent person. So I told my family I was moving out and so I was, I'll never forget, I was folding clothes one day. We were living in our apartment in Greenbelt. I was folding clothes one day. And um, I was, I just gotten off the phone with a classmate of mine. He was looking for a roommate. I was looking for one too. And he had told me the places that he was going to to look at. And so he was like, you know, you can make your appointments and go see the places. And I was like, all right, cool. And so I'm folding clothes one day and the Lord literally like in a loud voice said, I forbid you to move with him. And it shook me and I like dropped the clothes because I got scared. But the following day, I was still setting up apartment appointments. I was still setting up visits to go and to do this and to do that and to say, 
listen, I'm going to do this on my own. And God, because I'm yours and because I'm saved so much so, um, because I'm saved and because I want to do what I want to do, you're going to allow me to do it. And he said, not so. Again, you're not on my time. And so it's all of those things, you know, just being really, really fast and, you know, just doing what I wanted to do, had no regard for God or anything, like just nothing. And this was so far from what I had been brought up to learn or, or brought up to know. Like I was brought up in church, raised in church. So I know and I knew what it was to respect and to fear the Lord. I knew all of those things. But when it came down to that point, I did not want to do it. And I felt that because I am who I am and there's so much promise and so much greatness over and on my life that I can just do what I want to do. And when I get ready, I would say, you know what, I'm done busting it down. I'm done, you know, going here and going there. I'm done doing this and doing that. That God, you'll just go ahead and receive me. Because this will be a great testimony. I have an, an awesome testimony to tell the people in the church of how I did what I wanted to do. And then you were like, no. But he said, listen, that's not the testimony that I want to give you. And so we get out of the hospital and all of those things are happening. And then we've still got to go through the process of recovering and recuperating and all of those things. And, and I didn't understand what was happening at that moment. Um, this may not be a full hour because it's only 732. <laughs> But he said, that's not the testimony that I want to give you. The testimony that I want to give you is that you were crazy because I was at that point. You were crazy, but I gave you some sense. And now that you got your sense, you're working and you're doing what it is that I've asked you to do. You're, you're doing the conferences and you're writing and you're, you're talking and you're ministering and you're encouraging people because that's the route that I wanted you to take. Um, at that point, I think I, um, I always tell people that God never lets me do anything I want to do. Um, when I got out of high school, I said I wanted to work for a year, save up some money, apply to some places and, you know, do some things. And my family knew that and they were OK with it. And like the day before um, classes started, my aunt made like she took me to the school and she made me register to take classes. And I was like, but this is not a part of my plan. But if I had gone to somebody's campus out of state, who knows where or what I would be doing at this moment in time on uh, May 30th. Out, you know, 2017, I may not be saved. And if I am, I, I may not. I, I don't even know. Because if I had gone in that state and in that frame of mind, I probably would not be saved right now. Like at this moment. And it was uh, the, the wonderful thing and the beautiful thing that I love about this all is that um, God decided. Listen, I, only God knows. And at this point, I don't even want to know. I probably wouldn't have the friends that I have. I probably wouldn't have the same relationship with my family that I have. I would not have the developing testimonies and the stories and all the things that God is doing um, that he's working on behind the scenes in my life. I would not have those experiences had I not uh, uh, had I gone a different route. I would not have these. And granted, it was it was difficult. And this was something that the enemy really wanted to use to take me out. But when the Bible literally says all things work together, he literally will pull and somehow he'll do it. But he literally pulled all things and made them work together for my good. And even though everything in my life is not perfect, even though I, I am, you know, in the midst of some things and I'm like, God, are you sure there he, he's proven himself? And so I really don't have um, room at this point to fear or to question because he's done literally everything that I've needed him to do. He's done. He has provided. He is uh, he, he's healed. He has blessed. He's done a, a number of things that I could not even listen Listen, the ordering of, listen, when I tell you, when they said the steps of a good man, or even if you're not so good, when God's hand is on your life, he will literally put you in a situation. He will set up detours and he will reroute you and he will send you around a cul-de-sac. He will send you around a, a roundabout or a loopy loop or something to get you back at the place that he wants you to be in. If you would only listen, there are so many things that I probably would not have had to endure. If I had listened to wisdom when it was being given, if I had listened to those that cared for me and cared about me when I was a little younger. So 10 years ago, I was in a situation where I did not know whether or not I would live or die. I did not know if I would ever walk again. I did not know if I would ever learn how to say certain words. I did not know. You, you, I mean, talking about going to school and living on my own and, you know, any of that stuff. I did not ever know. That God would do that because every time they came in, they never said when he recovers. They always said if he recovers, it's not looking good. If the treatment doesn't work, we don't really know what else to do. If this doesn't work, then we don't know what else to do. And, you know, all of these things. 
But it literally came down to the point where I had to say, God, I trust you, even though I don't understand it, even though um, it, it's not making sense to me. I, I I trust you and I believe. And so there was a um, there was a day. And I think it was on this CD. I'm going to close this up in a little bit. Uh, we were watching. This was back when um, BET would show like music videos on Sunday mornings. And so I'm laying in the bed and I think they're trying to feed me or do something. Something's going on. Um, and Micah Stanley's I Believe came on, right? I mean, at this point, I love Micah Stanley. Um, and so when the song came on, like, I, I was like, okay, I'm good. God, I feel tears now. <laughs> I was like, I'm good. And so we were listening. So I asked my grandmother, I asked somebody to turn it up. And it started talking about how everything that happened, happened because somebody believed. It happened because, you know, by faith, you know, all things came to be. And so the end of the song started talking about, you know, I believe in miracles. I believe in signs and wonders. I believe, you know, if you set it in your word, that settles it in the earth. And I literally had a moment where I almost feel like I just kind of blacked out a little bit because I said, God, if you love me this much, that you would create this disease that one in a million people get, not one in 10, not one in 12, one in a million I don't fit any of the weight requirements, the age requirements, the race requirements. I don't fit any of that stuff. But somehow, some way, you knew um, this blue bag is trash right here. You knew that I was going to need Guillaume Barre as a way out. You knew that I was going to need to lose the ability of my legs. You knew that I was going to lose the ability to walk, the ability to feed myself. The ability to care for myself, and the only thing that I could do is sit back. He literally laid me on my be- on my back for 42 days, and I could not do anything. I could not go anywhere when I wanted to. I couldn't make a phone call when I wanted to because I could listen. I could not do anything. And at the end of all of this, the only thing that I could say is I believe, even though it's difficult, even though it's hard, even though I'm still in this hospital bed, I still believe. I still believe it's hard. It's difficult. This is painful. Why would you do this to me? I believe, but 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 even in the midst of all of that, I still believe. I still believe because you said it in your word, and that settles it. And you are not a man that you should lie. Neither are you the son of man that you should have to repent. So if you said it somehow or another, whether I see it, whether I don't, if I can trace it, if I can track it, at some point you've got to make good on the promise. That you made me, not because I'm good, but because you said it. You've got to make good on it because you said it. And you said that you honor your word above your name. And we know how strong his name is. We know how powerful his name is. And if you would think enough of me to put your name or put your word on me, to put your word over me to perform it, I've got nothing else to do but to sit back and wait for the performance. And even if the curtain comes down or comes up a little later than I expected, even if the people don't show up to perform when they need to perform, I know that greatness takes preparation. Greatness takes time. And if there's time being taken on my behalf, then I know that the performance is going to be just that great. I believe. And and it was really, really, (laughs) it was amazing because I was like, wow, like I've never really had to believe for anything like that before. It it was one thing prior to this moment to tell somebody, you know, God is a healer when I had not gone through anything. God is a healer when I had not had to, when when I was never sick. God is a healer when I was talking or, you know, I was living off of somebody else's testimony. But it says, I believe in miracles. And not only do I believe in miracles, I believe that I am a miracle. I believe that I am a sign and wonder. I believe that through me, you are going to demonstrate the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of, of healing and, and all of those gifts and all of that stuff. It's great when it comes to other people, but this was something that I had to literally depend on God for because the 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 uh, procedures and the treatments that they have or had for what, what it is that I was diagnosed with, hey, Dominique, those were things to slow it down, but there was nothing to treat it to completely heal it. So yes, what the doctors gave me slowed the process down, but I needed God to step in to to really put the seal on the process. Listen, I was laid up in that bed and I said, I have no other choice but to believe. You've not failed me up to this point, so why would I doubt you now? You've not 
<laughs> okay, I'm not doing this. You've not given me a reason to doubt you. I know that your record is good. I know that that your 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 resume and all of this other stuff, it's amazing and it's impeccable and your references check out every time. So why would I start to doubt you now? Even in the midst of what I'm presently going through, why would I doubt you now? If you could do and if you could heal me from Guillain-Barre, this foreign crazy disease that no one has ever heard of, surely this is nothing for you. If you can heal from Guillain-Barre, cancer is nothing. AIDS and HIV is nothing. High blood pressure, low blood pressure, whatever it is, diabetes, whatever it is, it is nothing for him. He just wants us to get to a place that we believe. And how bad do you believe? Surely you can do this thing. Um, another song that I... <laughs> Um, played a lot during that time this is the one I'm getting ready to play now it's called Sovereign God by Marette Brown Clark and it was really something that got me through because it says you're the sovereign God and you're bigger than all my problems in every situation there's nothing too hard for you Guillaume Barre 10 years ago laying in the hospital bed not knowing if I would ever uh, walk feed myself not knowing if I would ever be fully independent again that was a hard thing that was difficult for me. That was something that I never thought in a million years that I would face. I did not ever wake up thinking there's a high possibility that I may not be able to use my legs tomorrow. I never got up thinking that there's a possibility that the enemy wants to take me out so badly that he would go through all of this stuff and, to, you know, create this thing. And even though I put myself in there, I never thought that. And it wasn't until I got in that place that I was like, wait a minute, like, number one. If the enemy wants to get me that badly, then it's got to be something great on my life, number one. But then number two, God, if you would craft and you would think so much about me and those people that you've connected and assigned to me, that you would do this, that you would create this thing to kind of incubate me and to, to, to process me a little further and to mature me a little bit more. If you would do all of that for me, what is that saying about what you want to do in them? So when God allows me to meet somebody or to be a part of somebody's life, I don't take it lightly because I understand that there was a time that I was almost taken out of here. And it wasn't just because of the enemy. It was be it was on my own accord. I was the one who almost put myself out there. It was like I literally was taking my soul and saying, here you go, devil, go ahead, because I don't value it. I don't cherish it. But the Lord said, no, because you don't cherish it. I know what I've called you to do. I know the intent. And I know the end of a thing. I know the end of your life. And because I know the route that you're supposed to take, I can't let you go that way. I can't let you go that way. Even though you don't see what's going down that way, I created the road. I mapped it out so you can't go that way. And even though I see you going that way, I'll put a roadblock there. I'll set up a detour here. I'll make a U-turn here. And I'll put you right back where I want and need you to be so that you can go and do what I've asked you to do. So tonight's <laughs> um, video, I just wanted to encourage somebody. I know that your your whatever you're going through may not be as as major because sometimes we kind of classify a person's testimony. It may not be as major as you losing all every all feeling of everything from the neck down. It may not be that you are temporary paralyzing. It may not be that you. It may not be that you were you know in a hospital for 42 days. But it might be. But even if it's. God, I need you to pay my light bill because I really don't have it. And I've sacrificed and I've given to you the way that you've instructed me to do, but I just don't see it. Will you still believe that he's sovereign and that he's going to make good on his promise? Are you trusting him for your healing? Are you trusting him to perform? Because at this point, a testimony is not something that we accomplish. We're simply there to, to, to experience it. But a testimony is something that God performs. I did not heal myself. The testimony of healing from Guillaume Barre, I did not give myself. God gave it to me. A testimony is a gift, not a punishment, and it's not a curse. A testimony is a gift. It's a gift that God has given to you that shows you and shows other people that you've uh, grown to know him in a different way. You've grown to know him as a healer. We talked about it last week. The testimony of Lazarus being raised from the dead wasn't just... It wasn't just so that we could say it was a gift. It was a gift to say, listen, God did this for me. And he, you know, Mary and Martha can say he did it for my brother. Lazarus can say he did it for me. It's a gift. And it's a gift that keeps on giving. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. That is a gift.
so what happens is the more and more we testify, the more we start to talk about the things that God has done, is doing, and will do, the more we do that, we're, we're showing forth the gift that keeps on giving. Even the things that she's saying, every high place, every low place, everything in between the good and the bad. Well, in between even the good and the good or the good and the great, the good and the awesome, all of the, every up, every down, every ebb, every flow, every high, every low, every mountain, every valley, all of those things. He's created and he's fine-tuned and he's orchestrated these things to get you to a specific place. And he wants to make sure that when you get there, when the people that are waiting for you meet you, when you arrive at the place of your destination, that you have something to say. But what are you going to say to them if you don't allow him to take you through this? Got about 15, 14 more minutes. Um, I'll share this a little bit. And so um, everybody knows that me and my cousin, we presently live together. Um, she's got a baby now. I don't do newborns and stuff like that. Um, and so um, what we're doing at this point now is we are moving away from one another. All right? She's going her way. I'm going mine. So I've been having a little bit of a difficulty finding a place and, you know, all this other stuff. And I said, God, listen, you're not going to have me homeless. You're not going to have me out. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? If we, before we get back to the, but uh, again, doctor, and that's what I'm saying. If we realize and if we see our testimony as a gift and not a punishment, not a curse. Oh God, I'm going through this. I'm going through this. But why are you going through it? And who are you going through it for? Who are you going through it for? What is the purpose of this assignment? We talked uh, probably about a month or maybe a little bit more than that about the serving storm. If you see every storm as your servant, you would allow it to work for you. When you have a servant, you tell the servant what to do and how to do it and when to do it. Okay, I'm hungry. Go get me something to eat. I need this. This needs to be cleaned. You can go clean it now. This needs to be done. You can go and do it now. So if you look at every storm, everything that you go through that same way, I need strength. This storm is here to strengthen me. You're going to do it. This storm is going to build my faith and you're going to do it. So then when this storm is over, I can tell somebody else who's going through a similar storm or maybe even the same storm that the rain is going to stop and the sun will come out again. But if I see it as, oh, God is raining in my life again, then I'll never be able to properly give a testimony that says that I've overcome. A lot of times the reason that our testimonies are not effective is because there's no conquering. There's no overcoming. We always stop in the middle of. And we stop in the middle and say, well, you know, I'm still going through. But where's the victory in that? Where's the victory in that? Um, it was funny back then, but now that I'm thinking about it, there was a lady that I knew and she got up and she told the testimony in church one day. She said, I got a victory for my apartment, but God told me to go look for a house. And she never finished it. I said, ma'am, that's not a testimony. That's a statement. Because if you didn't get the house, who are you encouraging? And if you look at it, it's great that God is telling you to go look for something greater. That's wonderful. But where's the victory? If there's nothing that you overcame, then why are you telling us this? Listen, you got to look through the hills because that's where your help comes from. That's where... The Listen... That's where, alright, I'm done because after this I feel like I'm getting ready to go off in a little bit. But again, the reason I've been asking people to pray is because, you know, I've been having a little bit of difficulty finding a place. I'm like, God, look, you've never put me out before. You've, I've never been in a situation where I was going from shelter to shelter, living from pillar to post. I've never done that. And I don't believe that in 2017 we're going to start it. So somehow or another, you're going to go ahead and work this. And I'm waiting on a call. I mean, I believe that by the end of the week, this week, there will be something that said that I will be able to boldly declare God did it again. <laughs> God did it again because he's not the type of person. Listen, and, and it's funny because this is probably one of the hardest things that I've had to go through. Right. And I was telling the people when I preached a couple of weeks ago, every time we go through something, it's always this is the hardest thing that I've ever been through until we get through or get to the next hardest thing that we've ever been through. He takes you through cancer. Cancer was the hardest thing I ever had to go through. 
and then you're faced with the foreclosure of your house, and then that's the hardest thing that you've ever gone through. And then you're faced with the divorce, and then that's the hardest thing that you've ever gone through. And then your kids are acting up, and then that's the hardest thing that you've ever gone through. And so it's always the hardest thing that you've ever gone through until it's the hardest thing that you've ever gone through. And if God has brought you out of that one, and out of that one, and out of that one, and out of that one, surely He will do it again in this one. Even sometimes if it's not the way that you desire, or if it's not the way that you hope, He will do it. And even throughout this process, because I didn't get the call to, you know, some stuff fell apart at the last minute. Um, and when I got the call, uh, this time last year when I was uh, dealing with housing, trying to move to Chicago, I completely shut down. I said, you know what, forget it, just don't worry about it, I'm not going, just forget it, bye, shut it down, just cut it off. But this time I said, God, this is the same test, and I'm feeling the same way, but this time I'm going to practice what I've been preaching, and I'm going to change my perspective, change my outlook, and I'm going and I'm going to believe you for what I cannot see. I'm going to believe that you will do for me what you've done for other people. I'm just going to believe it. You've done it. You've done it before and I have no choice but to believe that you'll do it again. And when I tell you that he is doing it behind the scenes he's working. and, and the So today I went to a place and the lady was looking at my application. I put that I was a student. And so she said, well, you don't qualify because you're a student. And, you know, students and blah, blah, blah. I said, well, give me that paperback. And so she was like, you know, well, you might be from corporate, and I don't know who you are. You know, I don't want to break the rules of, you know, where I work. And I said, let me tell you something, honey. I don't, I don't have time to be in here, you know, trying to dupe you and trick you. And my grandmother said, he ain't no crook. He a man of God. He ain't no whatever, whatever. He's a man of God. And I said, listen here, ma'am. Let's get this thing done. And so she said, well, I got to think about it. I said, okay, go ahead and think about it. Let Jesus touch your heart. And so she started talking and she was like, okay. So she grabbed the application and she gave it back to me and all of that. And that to me was a glimpse of favor because she could have said, nope, you're a student. You don't qualify. You got to go somewhere else. But the fact that God touched her in that moment, I'm believing and I'm declaring that the place that I saw today that was beautiful, that I've already set up in my mind, that I'm going to be able to get the keys and walk in it. <laughs> I'm going to get the keys and walk in and I'm going to call it my own. And even if he doesn't do it for that one, he's going to do it. And that's been one of the things that I'm like, you know what, God, it's been difficult and it's been hard. It's like every time I get to a place where I start to doubt, uh, somebody sends me something that they don't even know that I need. Somebody calls. Thank you, Kendra. Somebody calls and, and gives me something. Somebody leaves me a message or sends me a text that says, you know, God is going to do this. And God told me to tell you this. And I'm like, God, you got it. You got it. At this point, it's all in your hands. Listen, I mean it's time to do the Kimmy. I will do the Kimmy right now. And it was... <laughs> Hallelujah to him. And so it was amazing because I was like, even in that, like, if I doubted him, even up to now, what happened today when she said, you know what, go ahead. And she was giving me extra papers and different papers and all of this other stuff. She did everything that needed to be done. And she, she was a little nasty at first. But my grandmother said, even though she's a little nasty, we're not going to treat her the way that she's treating us. We started to, you know, listen and look and see what was going on. She was a little flustered because she was short-staffed today, and we get that and we understand that. So she worked with us, and we worked with her, and we, you know, we left. We did what we needed to do, and so I'm believing that to, tomorrow. She didn't call today because I think the office is closed early today. But I'm believing that tomorrow, by this time tomorrow, I would have received some good news and that I'll be walking into another level of, of something that other people would not have been able to attain. That I'll be walking into something that I'll be granted something from the Lord and by the Lord that other people did not think it was possible for me to get or to obtain. And even sometimes I didn't even think it was possible for me to obtain. I had to have a real heart to heart conversation with the Lord today. I said, listen, you will have to do it. You will have to do it because at this point, I can't do nothing else. I, I, there's literally nothing else that I can do. You're going to have to do it. And so I believe he's going to do it. So thank you. I think, and so throughout the night, throughout the day, I need you all to just continue to pray that everything goes smoothly. Listen, I mean apply for a job. That everything goes smoothly. That everything goes off without a hitch. And that there are no more delays, no more holdups, no more hindrances, no more hiccups. Because I am getting ready to walk into something. And to another level of independence, another level of trusting God. And I'm going to need the prayers of the saints. Hey, uh, Pastor Stevenson. And so that was it. I just wanted to testify <laughs> 10 years ago today. Um, and, and it's funny because this past weekend could have been 
where my family was setting up a 10 year memorial for me because I was no longer here. You see what I'm saying? This, hey Byron, what happened 10 years ago, something that I went through and came out of 10 years ago, could have been something that lived, that I died in and my family could be having, okay, but let's go uh, do another in remembrance of Justin. You know, I, I remember the good times we had. I remember the this, I remember the that. But God said, no, I've got purpose on your life and there is nothing that I will allow to happen to you unless I allow it to happen. And you were not meant to die 10 years ago and you've got more years and you've got more things to do and you can't die until I fulfill every word that I've spoken over your life. Not just for me, but for everybody else. We can't, we can't die in what we're in. As, uh, when I preached a couple of weeks ago, I said, if you don't see victory, it's not the end. Better is the end of a thing. And the Bible talks about, you know, it, situations ending in victory when he comes. If you are still in something, it's not the end. If you are still something and you don't see victory in it, then you've not reached the end and you've still got some more to go. Listen, can't die till you're empty and I'm good and full. <laughs> there are people that I've got to impact. There are people that I have to encourage. There are things that I need to do and there are things that I have to see their places that I have to go and there are people that I have to minister to and even you are there are people that you all have to impact and to minister to and to snatch out of the kingdom of darkness and bring them over into the kingdom of light so even if it's something that that the doctors cannot cure even if it's something that that's difficult and that's hard you cannot die in that you can't die in that a couple years ago a friend of mine um, told me about some things that he was some health challenges he was having um, but he said, you know, that the Lord showed him that he was going to have some children. I said, well, if you're not healed and you don't have your children, then you're not going to die in that. I know it's difficult, but you've got to get through that so that you can get on to the end of the promise. Okay, Kendra, <laughs> you think you're good. But there are people that you've got to speak into their lives. There are people that you have to impact. There are things that God is literally waiting to birth in and out of you so that the world can be impacted and affected. So you can't die here. You can't die in this place. None of us can die in the place that we're in because it's not what God has said. And th this is not the end. And I would even say if God is still speaking, then that means that he's extending your life. If God is still speaking, that's a sign that there's still more for you to do. If God is still speaking about the things that he wants to do and that he's going to do in your life and you have not seen them come to pass yet, you cannot die. And there's a, a video that I was watching a couple of years ago. This lady was talking about how her son was sick and all these other things. And she said that she told the Lord, if he dies before the promises that you've made manifest between then and now, you must be going to raise him. You must be going to raise him. And it was, it was funny to me because she said it with such power and with such strength. If he dies now, between now and then, you must be going to raise him. If you die now, between now and then, God must be going to raise you so that he can show somebody else that he's the resurrection. So that he can show somebody else that he's a perpetual life giver. So that he can show somebody else that every dead thing that or everything that looks dead is not dead. So, God, I know that this thing looks a little low and it looks dead. But he said, but God, I'm putting you at your word. If this is what you said and I don't see it, between then and now, you must be going to raise it. Between then and the end, you must be going to raise it. You must be going to fix it. You must be going to change it. Because it's not victory, so I know this is not over. It's not the end. Bruce Parham has a song. I'm going to play that, and then after that, I'm going to be done. But it says, it's not over. It's not the end. Remember, Jesus died, and he rose again. Do I, I don't even know if I have that on here anymore. Um, but if I don't, then that's fine. Just go and look it up. Um, but that's what it says. It said, listen, it's not over. It's not the end. Jesus died, and he rose again. So even though people thought Jesus was dead, he, God said, listen, I, must, I, I got to raise him. Because there are people... Who, who need to know that I can raise things from the dead. There are people that need to know that I can bring things up from the dead. They got to know that just because it looks dead, it's not dead. So, Jesus, you're going to be my example. I must be going to raise them. And he did it. So, it's 7.59. <laughs> and I would play. I don't know where it is. It's not here right now on my computer or something. And my internet's acting up. So, I'll post the link to that song in the comment section of this here video. Um, but I've encouraged you this week, share your testimony with somebody. Let them know that, listen, where you are is not where you will remain always. What you're doing is not the way that it's always going to be. 
Um, we'll play this as we're closing out. I don't know where this whole play music thing came from, but it works and it's great. <laughs> but again, the anthem says, you know, you've won the victory. You've won it all for me. Like death couldn't hold you down. So even though death entered in, there was something that died. There was something that failed. There was something that faltered. It could not hold you down. It couldn't. You had to get up and you had to get. <laughs> I mean, I'm about to get a new job as a DJ. You had to get up. And the reason that you had to get up was not just so much for me, but it was so that I could tell somebody else that you can get up. That whatever you're going through, even if it seems dead, God can raise it. God can bring it up. God can heal. He can deliver. He can do all of these things. And when you say it, you won't just be saying words that you heard somebody else say. You'll be saying it from a place of experience. I went to service on Sunday. I mean, the pastor was preaching. He said, listen, God shows himself to people two ways, by revelation and by experience. What is God trying to get you to experience so that then that can become your revelation of who he is? Amen. Amen. So, love you guys so much. Thanks for listening to the testimony. <laughs> I hope that somebody was encouraged by it. I'm praying that, you know, throughout the week, throughout the month, throughout the coming days or whatever it is, that you take this with you. If it is not victory, if you don't see victory, then it's not the end. If what you presently see is not victorious, then it's not over. If what you're presently going through is still bleak and it's dim and it's dark and you still feel like you're in the valley, then it's not over yet. God still got some more to do. Love you too, Lamia. He still got some more for you to see. He still got some more for you to experience. And you cannot die until you come out of it. You can't die because people are waiting for you. People are waiting to hear what you have to say. But will you give them the right message? Will you tell them I died in the middle of it? Or will you tell them God brought me out and he can do it for you? What will be your testimony? Will you share the right gift with them? Or will you give them a curse? Your testimony. Hey, uh, Bishop Brock. Your testimony is a gift, not a curse. The things that God is taking you through is a gift. He's giving you something. He's allowing you to experience and to know him in a different way. He's allowing you. To show you, uh, he's allowing you to see him for who he is, to see him in a different light, to understand that he is that he is. He is who you need him to be whenever you need him to be it and how you need him to be it. For me, he's a, a, a softened heart on a leasing consultant. For somebody else, he's a, a, a debt remover, a debt canceller. He's all of those things. Whatever we need him to be, he's a way maker. But will you allow him to be that in your life? That's the question. Will you allow him to develop and to prop and to give you the fullness of the gift? My aunt, I say this and I'm leaving one year for my birth, you know, my Christmas, uh, Christmas and my birthday are four days apart. So one year she gave me a gift. She gave me a pair of shoes. She gave me one shoe on Christmas and one shoe on my birthday. And that, uh, when she gave me the shoe on Christmas, that was a gift, but it was an incomplete gift because I could not wear that. I could not present that to anybody because I did not have the rest of it. Will you allow God to give you the fullness of the gift or will you walk around with half of it because you're content? Will you allow him to give you both shoes or will you just take one because you're happy with the one? Listen, Kendra, that's it. I'm, I'm logging off. <laughs> and it was funny back then. But now that you think about it, if, if your testimony is a gift, if I only give you one shoe, you don't have a complete testimony. If you only have one, one sock, you don't have a complete testimony. Will you allow him to give you the gift of the fullness of the testimony? Will you take half of it because you don't want to go through the rest to get it? You don't want to wait to get it. I had to wait four days to get it, but I got it. Will you allow him to work that out and to process you through that so that you can get the fullness of the gift? Or will you settle for just the scraps on the table? Listen, Dr. Bright, talk to your best friend. She played me that year. <laughs> I mean, she played me. But now that we look at it, we think about it, if it didn't happen, I wouldn't have that little analogy and I wouldn't have that revelation. If even though sometimes God will show you something, he'll give you a glimpse of it. You sometimes have to wait to get there. And when you get it, it'll complement something that you already have. Those shoes complemented things that I had in my closet. And then I was able to go out and buy things to complement them. So when God gives you a testimony, he gives you something to complement it. He gives you an audience to present it to. And then he also, uh, people that you already know, and then he'll also bring people in, <laughs> bring people in to hear what it is you have to say. Amen? Amen. <laughs> so we're going to pray and close out. And remember, share your testimony with somebody this week. Brighten their day. Encourage them. Let them know that if they do not see victory, then it's not the end of whatever it is they're going through. All right? All right.
<laughs> Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, we give you praise, we give you glory. Because you're good and because you're God. We're praying, God, that tonight that the testimony, oh God, that I've shared would encourage and will impact, will help uplift somebody and let them know, God, that you still heal, that you still work miracles and that you still make ways out of no way. God, even when doctors, oh God, and when people and when things do not line up, when circumstances are not ideal, you still come in, oh God, and you work and you say that I am the God that can change and do all things and there is nothing too hard for me. Father, we thank you even now, God, and we rejoice in your ability, Father. Before you do it, we rejoice in the fact that you're able. Before you do it, oh God, we rejoice because we know that you can and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So I will see you all. Hey, uh, Prophet Williams, we're just logging off. My cousin is liturgical dancing too. It's not over. <laughs> it's not over. It's not the end. Remember, Jesus died and he rose again. I don't know what this dance is giving. That's her flag. <laughs> I'm screaming, but I love you guys. Thank you guys so much for joining me tonight for our Tuesday Talk Testimony Edition. Um, yeah, we'll probably do something tomorrow because I'm believing God's going to blow my mind tomorrow and I'm going to have an awesome, awesome testimony. We're going to have to play some praise dance music tomorrow. Um, Y'all might just have to watch me give him a shout. Hallelujah. All right, but I love you guys. I'll see you tomorrow at some point. And, <laughs> I mean, bless her. And um, testimony's still loading, but it's coming and I'm believing God. So thank you all in advance for praying with me. And for me that we come out of this with our hands up and victorious. Amen. Hallelujah. I will see you all tomorrow. Love you.